Thank you, Adam, and, and, and thank you for, uh, for, for inviting me to speak at this event. I, it, it's, it's truly exciting to speak about Europe in the US. Uh, it, 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 it's sometimes much easier to be here to speak about Europe than in <laughs> Europe. It's like when you speak about Europe in Europe, it's, it's too much of a family affair, and, and we, we cannot always say who is really the rotten apple or, or the black sheep in the family. Um, and so, so it is interesting to be here. Um, I am particularly happy that Adam has invited me because I'm a great fan of Adam's work on, on history. And I think we can learn a lot of that from that work about what is happening now. And when we think about the present crisis that, that is unfolding in Europe, and the crisis is still unfolding in Europe, I must say that the echoes of the 1930s are there and they're very, very clear. And if you were a Marxist, which I'm not, uh, you could only make one conclusion that we were on the way to something very, very bad geopolitically. I think Peter will help us interpret that. But, you know, it's hard not to see the similarities between the present crisis and what unfolded in the 1930s, both in terms of how the crisis unfolded economically and particularly, in my view, monetarily, uh, but also how it plays out in terms of the political response and the political crisis and the rise of European populism uh, or nationalism across Europe. So there is a lot of similarities to the 1930s. Uh, I hope that we, have, we will break away from those similarities. Uh, historians like Adam will uh, hopefully help us to, to understand uh, that question. But at the core of what I will be saying is that I think that we should try to reevaluate the whole idea of how we think about the crisis. I could have had this presentation about how I think we had the wrong view of the U.S. crisis, which we initially called a subprime crisis and a debt crisis and all that. Uh, my argument would be that the crisis that is unfolding in Europe and this crisis that is called the Great Recession has very little to do with debt. That is the outcome of the crisis, that problems is the outcome of the crisis rather than the cause of the crisis and at the core of the crisis. And unfortunately, policymakers in Europe do not really grasp that. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of Calvinist ethics to what is going on in the term, in the way we respond to the crisis in Europe. I'll try to get into that without being too sarcastic. Uh, as we go along. What's the standard view? The standard view of the crisis is that it's a debt crisis. It's all about, again, here comes in the Calvinist ethics of the whole thing. We had seven fat years, now we'll have seven lean years. It's terrible. But that's really not the real crisis. But let's see. Have a look at it. <coughs> here is a, the debt to GDP uh, ratios of uh, number of European countries, it's public debt. I stole these numbers from my friend uh, David Beckworth. David is a fellow market monetarist and I must admit have very, very similar views to mine or the other way around. Um, but take for example a look at Greece down here. Greek public debt, yes, right, it's around 100% of GDP, but it was not rising prior to the crisis. There was no sign that debt was becoming unsustainable, even for some countries like Belgium, uh, it was declining. <coughs> the Netherlands, it was declining. The reason for this is, of course, is, 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 is there are two factors in debt to GDP. There is the debt and there is the nominal GDP. And what really happened was this. Ah, this is good, because there you can only see one of the two graphs on the slide, which makes it much better. You can see the, 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 the black line here is nominal GDP relative to its pre-crisis trend. <laughs> it collapsed. You can't see the other graph, we should be there, which is debt to GDP, which move in the opposite direction. But I will show you now in the, the, the next graph. But that is really at the core of the crisis. It's the collapse and the contraction in economic activity broadly speaking, more specifically in nominal GDP in Europe, which is at the core of the debt crisis. The debt crisis is the outcome 
of the collapse in nominal GDP, not the cause of it. <coughs> and I will argue that the crisis we gone through in Europe is all about the euro. It's not about lazy Greeks or evil French. You know, you can actually use Uber in Paris these days. I did it recently, and it works perfectly fine. <laughs> there was a bit of strikes going on before that, but it's possible. It's not about that. It's not about too much regulation. It's not about all of the things we've been talking about. I am no great, great fan of the Northern European welfare state. I am no great of French style regulation or Italian firing and hiring rules or French pension schemes. But the structural problems of Europe is not what caused the crisis and it's not why Europe still has significant problems. The failure lies in the Euro itself. It lays in the idea that one size fits all and one size do not fit all. And a way to illustrate that is looking at real GDP growth. I could have taken nominal, but you know, let's take real. This is a change in real GDP from 2007 until 2015. The, I have taken 31 European countries. The green ones are countries with floating exchange rates and the red ones are countries with pegged exchange rate or euro membership. There are two pegged exchange rates, it's Bulgaria and Denmark. The rest are in the euro. Bulgaria and Denmark are pegged to the euro. What do you see? Well, half of the European countries with pegged exchange rate or euro membership have had have lower real GDP levels today than in 2007. No wonder that the European electorate are angry with their politicians. They might be wrong at the wrong institution, meaning government rather than central bank, but the point is that you had tremendously negative performance. There are a few outliers. Lithuania is actually a more statistical uh, 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 coincidence because the crisis in Lithuania started in 2010, 9-10 rather than in 2008-9. Uh, so if you look at that, that disappears. Other than that, it's small countries. But see, half of all the European, Euro countries have had negative GDP growth throughout uh, since 2007, while all of the countries with floating exchange rates in Europe have higher GDP today than in 2007. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. <clears throat> I'm a Dane, so let's say something bad about my own country. Denmark have had a pegged exchange rate since, well, 1875, with the exception of two years, 1931, 1932. Uh, but has been in the present kind of setup since the start of the euro, really had the same kind of peg since 1982. This is a Scandinavian country, uh, and our Nordic countries, it's Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, and Finland. It's the same as before, but just let's illustrate it. This is the real GDP level index at 100 at Q4 2007. There are two countries with pegged exchange with our euro membership, Finland and Denmark. I'm particularly happy that Antibod is here today because Anne and I have a, a common interest and heritage or, or legacy in terms of Iceland. Uh, see Iceland, which had a banking collapse on an extreme scale in 2008. Those of involved in that remember that as something truly horrible, both in terms of banking management mistakes and policy mistakes. It's unfolded in a dramatic fashion. But if you look at Icelandic real GDP today, Icelandic real GDP is higher than real GDP in Finland and in Denmark, hmm. despite of a total banking collapse. What's the difference? A floating exchange rate, monetary policy sovereignty, that a country can conduct monetary policy to the needs of the country. It's extreme. I think that particularly the interest, Finland is interesting here because Finland is a country which is doing all the things that the Calvinists in the Netherlands and Germany are saying. Or in Denmark, or in Sweden, or in Finland, I'm sure. 
I use the term Calvinist <laughs> in an economic sense, not in a religious sense. <clears throat> it's a way of bad-mouthing my own heritage. Uh, it's probably the term, right? <laughs> well, it, it's uh, right for the Netherlands, not for, for, for Denmark or, uh, for, or Sweden. But <laughs> well, they can be put into the same category. They are lucky to have a floating exchange rate. But, but see here, Finland has performed terrible. In fact, Finland has performed so terrible that the crisis in Finland is now deeper than during the Great Depression. It is deeper than the fin Finnish banking crisis of the 90s, where Finland was hit by both a banking crisis and a collapse of the Soviet Union at the same time. This is the scale of the problem in Finland, but they've done all the right things. They're very austere. They're doing all the right things, according to the EU Commission and the ECB, and the head of the Bundesbank. <coughs> Let's look at another example of the same thing. Turkey and Greece, two neighboring countries known for political instability, uh, Geopolitical uncertainty, often involving each other, by the way. <laughs> um, both countries, this is real GDP per capita. Going back to 1980, the countries performed quite similarly until 2001, where something happened. Both countries changed direction dramatically in terms of monetary policy. Turkey had a major crisis in 2001. As a result of that, had to let the currency flow had then turned out to be a blessing, while Greece joined the Euro in 2008. And until 2008, things were developing quite similarly. But then see after 2008, Greece has performed horribly, and Turkey has performed so-so. Turkey has really tried to perform badly. <laughs> you have a war in a neighboring country, you have a, you have a president that increasingly is acting in authoritarian fashion. You have major corruption scandals. Every six months there is a rumor of a new military coup. All these things. And I'm thinking, how would Turkey have performed since 2008 had Turkey had a pegged exchange rate? Well, my argument would be that we'll have had banking crisis every six months. Uh, would, have, would have ended in a government default. But it didn't. Instead, we had every second year, we had a 30% devaluation of the currency, or depreciation, I should say. Has that been great? No. Has things been unstable politically, monetarily? Yes. Financially? Yes. But there has not been the same kind of massive macroeconomic and financial collapse as we see in Greece because the exchange rate serves as that shock absorption. And that brings me to the next issue. <clears throat> I'm naturally not a Keynesian, but when I look at the Eurozone, the interesting thing is that a monetarist and a Keynesian analysis of the situation is completely the same. Hmm. So you have the two most important macroeconomic schools in the past 100 years agreeing on the causes of the crisis. And despite of that, policymakers don't listen to either of these two. What it is, is that it's about demand. And the Keynesian perspective, we, we want to focus on our fiscal policy. And what I've done here is I looked at the fiscal stance of the Eurozone countries from before and on the floating exchange rate countries in the Eurozone, the same 31 countries. I should say I've used a simple average. So Germany and Denmark among the peggers and the Euros are the same. But just to show it, this is the change in the fiscal stance. So an increase is fiscal, <coughs> is fiscal easing. A decrease is fiscal tightening in percent of GDP. What you will notice is that this, it seems like there seems to be quite a bit of coordination in Europe. We seem to have the same fiscal policy. By the way, pro-cyclical fiscal policy. When things are good, we ease. When things are bad, we tighten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is the best argument, again, any Keynesian argument, is that it's politically not leading to the right thing. But see here, the peggers and the floaters started to tighten monetary policy in 2010-11. That was the initial response to the crisis. 
I don't think it's about right or wrong. It was just a, simply a, a question about are you running out of money? There is no other choice. It's not about having the right policies. If, you, if nobody will fund you, you have to tighten fiscal policy. And everybody in Europe did that and have been doing so in general since 2010. However, how about the outcome of this? This is the debt level to GDP. See, the green line is the floaters, the red line are the peggers and the Eurozone members. We have been tightening fiscal policy since 2010. What have happened to Eurozone debt? Just continued to go up. While in the floater countries, since 2011, we have seen stabilization. By the way, if you put in America, uh, in the, put in the US, it will be a similar mm. to the debt developments of countries like Poland, Turkey, UK, Sweden, declining debt levels, moderately so, but declining nonetheless since 2010-11. Why? Well, the reason is this. There is a link between the development in nominal GDP and debt to GDP. See here, I'll now argue that Germany has been no more austere than Greece. In fact, Germany has been less austere than Greece. This is the change in public debt as share of GDP, and this is the change in nominal GDP, both for 2007 to 2014. You will see Greece is directly on the regression line here. Germany is slightly below, so okay, maybe a little bit of more steer. But in general, the relationship is one that if your economy collapses, your public finances worsen dramatically. Hmm. That's the story. And who are in charge of controlling nominal GDP? The ECB. Nominal spending growth is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. The ECB can set whatever level for nominal GDP it wants. It cannot set whatever level for real GDP, but it can fully controls nominal GDP. In fact, if tomorrow we had a press release that Mario Draghi had stepped down as ECB boss, and new ECB boss would be Gideon Gono. I'm sure you all know who Gideon Gono is, the central bank governor of Zimbabwe. <laughs> I'm sure that the market reaction would be rather violent to that. Would you doubt in any second that Gideon Gona was able to increase nominal GDP in the Eurozone? We would all agree he could do that. He could increase it by a million percent, two million percent. He has a good track record for doing that. I think Paul Krugman talked about looking irresponsible. He talked about Ben Bernanke showing up in a Hawaii shirt. I don't agree with everything Bern, uh, Paul Krugman says. Actually, most things I don't agree with. But he's completely right on that. Monetary policy works. Monetary policy controls nominal GDP. We can print as much money as we will, and we can increase nominal GDP as much as we want. There is no liquidity trap. If there were a liquidity trap, meaning that in some way we couldn't increase inflation because we are still a little bound, why do we have taxes? If we can print money without any impact on inflation, that would actually be great because then we should just abolish taxes and print money to finance all our public expenditures. And we all know that the result of that would be hyperinflation and that's exactly why we don't do it. My argument is that what has happened is that, is that the Eurozone has been reluctant to ease monetary policy because there has been this concept, perception that monetary policy was already very easy. But here I want to quote Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman said about Japan in 1997, when he, Milton Friedman advocated quantitative easing for Japan, interest rates are low, not because monetary policy is easy, but because monetary policy has been tight. Because if monetary policy is tight, you have low growth and low inflation expectations, and that is why you have low interest rates. Interest rates were not high, low in Zimbabwe in 2008 when the country had hyperinflation. They were high. The relationship between nominal interest rates and inflation and growth expectation is consistently positive rather than negative. 
So the idea that we should focus on interest rates is completely wrong. We should focus on expectations of, in, uh, of growth and expectations of inflation of normal or GDP expectations, and that can be determined by the GDP. The ECB, however, did something different. At the height of the crisis back in 2010-11, the ECB started to talk about making conditions for easing monetary policy. Meaning we are telling the markets that if uh, Berlusconi wins in Italy, we're not easing monetary policy. Or if we don't have a new government in Greece, we're not easing monetary policy. Which you are, and that by the way, saying to the markets, we conduct monetary policy based on a rule. And the rule is, we want to have Eurocrats in power in different countries. Meaning that election or, or opinion polls actually became monetary policy. Because once you get more support for Syriza in Greece, or God knows in Italy, who knows in Italy, one other clown than the other, and, but that's actually a fact. Uh, that's a popular thing. We also had a clown party in Iceland. Um, then that becomes determining of monetary policy. <laughs> Luckily, I think we have moved away from that in Europe. We have moved away from that. And that is why, in my view, that the Greek crisis have not had bigger spillover effects this year than it had. Because there is an expectation now in the market that, monetar uh, that, that any shock in Greece would be offset by more quantitative easing from the ECB. They got it pretty damn right in January. However, that does not change the fact that one size does not fit all. And that is at the core of the problem within the next two years. Imagine that the ECB continue quantitative easing, the recovery in Europe uh, continues. Then in two years, we will have property prices in Germany going up by 15%. We will have six, 7% wage growth We'll have 3 4% inflation. We'll have a sharp drop in the current account situation. Those of us who have been screaming for that sort of thing would say, that's just fine, that's what we need. But the Germans will be very upset. And at that time, they will no longer accept monetary easing. And we'll get that shock interest rate hike of 200 basis points, 2 percentage points, or whatever. And in that situation, Spain blows up, or Greece, or whatever. So we haven't changed the fact that the euro is a monetary union that by no measure is optimal. And therefore, at the core of this is that we have forced upon Europe something where we said we all have to be the same. In terms of, of the lack of political unity, it comes to me from the euro has created that. Mm. And again, Milton Friedman had warned against this. When we, when we push upon it, this monetary strangulation mechanism, we get a political backlash. We could have had a successful internal market with floating exchange rate within that market. Instead, we had to do the whole thing because we wanted to create a European super state. And now we've got political dissonance. Now we've got the hatred and the incompetence then to handle any crisis. When, when Willem is, is suggesting that well, it could all work if we just did this and this and this. That's what Harold Damson's called the you know, uh, uh, Nirvana fallacy. We, sub we, we are comparing the actual situation to what could have been if we just designed it correct. But we didn't, and we won't. Uh, so you know, to me, there, 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 there is huge risk of continued disunity. Uh, and with that also come all these political negative situations. And, so, and, and you, you, it, it's, it's extremely concerning to see people in the parliament in Greece wearing uniforms and showing the swastika. Uh, it's extremely concerning to see the same thing in a country like Hungary, by the way, with a floating exchange rate, I will admit that. Uh, or a Jeremy Coburn, who represents the most insane Marxist ideas that ever came out of Britain. Uh, that is the political reality of political discourse in Europe today. Well, Engels came from Britain, right? Yeah, yeah. Gentlemen, we yeah. could go on all night. Yeah. This has been we absolutely will. fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you very much for being here and giving us such an interesting <laughs>